that's why coefficient of variation is actually quite useful. Okay, so far we've been looking at single attributes. We've been looking at single attributes. Let's start looking at multiple attributes or two attributes at the same time because in data analytics we are often interested in the relationships between attributes not just single attributes alone right of course information about single attributes is useful like finding the measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion and the things we've looked at so far but things start getting more and more interesting when we look at multiple attributes okay so here we've got two attributes and for convenience, I've just named them X and Y. You know, it could have been height and weight, or it could have been, you know, sales and, uh, uh, you know, the, the industry in which a company is in, whatever. We could have looked at those. We're just looking at uh, X and Y as two attributes of some data set. Okay. So now you could plot the points because every point in your data set has a value for X and a value for Y. Let's say the X and Y are height and weight. And these are heights and weights of lots of different people. Every person has a height and a weight, right? So every person is represented by a point, okay? So every point here represents one of the persons in our data set, if X and Y are height and weight, okay? So now what we might be interested in is to say, how are these two attributes, X and Y or height and weight, changing together, okay? Here we can see that broadly speaking, higher X implies higher Y. Right, because the, the the points are all going from bottom left to top right generally. Right, we are not always saying that if the x is higher, it means that y will always be higher. That is not true. Right, for example, here this has a higher x, but it has a lower y than this point, which has a lower x but a higher y. Right, so there are exceptions, but by and large, a higher value for x seems to be indicating a trend towards a higher value of y. Okay, so that shows you that there is a certain relationship between X and Y. If you're given a value of X, you might be able to use it to predict the value of Y, right? If the points were all over the place, then X has no influence on Y at all. But in this case, it seems to be that X has some influence on Y. Okay, so that's what we mean by relationships. To what extent does Y increase when X increases and decrease when Y decreases? Okay, and to what extent are X and Y so sort of marching together? Okay, so let's consider two cases of X and Y and some relationships, right? In which of these two graphs, uh, these two charts, do you see X and Y marching together to a much greater extent? Okay, that is in which one is more lockstep behavior between X and Y of the two? Now clearly the points here on the right hand side, if you look at the points, okay, they are all much closely, tightly clustered around together, around an imaginary line, if you like. Okay, so if you were able to draw an imaginary line here, you would find that all these points are much closer to the imaginary line than the points here. Okay, roughly speaking. So you would say in this case that the second chart exhibits greater lockstep behavior. Things are much closer to each other. The points are much closer to each other and uh, not each other, but much closer to an imaginary line that, that you can draw through the points. Okay, now a way to operationalize this measure in mathematical terms is what is called as the covariance, right? We already saw uh, how you can take the difference of the values from the mean, right? So here, xi, uh, mu x is the mean of x, mu y is the mean of y. So we are taking xi minus mu x, right? That is the difference of each of the values from its corresponding mean, uh, each of the x values from the mean and each of the y values from the mean, and we are multiplying them together, okay? And then, uh, you know, taking the sum of all that and taking the average by dividing by n, okay? This is called covariance. How do the two values vary together? Now, of course, if all the x's and y's are identical, Right? If all the x values are 10 and if all the y values are 20, then every single point is 10, 20. And therefore, uh, xi minus mu, I is, mu x is 0, yi minus mu y is 0, and therefore covariance is 0. Okay? There is uh, absolutely no variance at all. Okay? But otherwise, if there are variations, then 
you can use this to calculate what is called as a covariance. Okay, let's take a look at what the covariance, uh, you know, intuitively means. Okay, so here we can see if x and y are both greater than their means or both less than their means, then the numerator is positive. Of course, the denominator is fixed, right? In other words, uh, when x is greater than mu x, if y also tends to be greater than mu y, then xi minus mu x is positive, yi minus mu y is positive, so the product is positive, okay? And if uh, x is less than mu x and y also happens to be less than mu y for whenever x is less than mu x, then once again, both those terms are negative, but the product becomes positive, okay? So that's the thing. This term, when, you know, if, if whenever x is greater than mu x, y also tends to be greater than mu y, then the covariance would be positive, okay? So let's see how that turns out. And, uh, but it so happens that if when one is greater than x, uh, greater than the mean, and the other is less than the mean, then the product will be negative because one of those two terms will be negative. Let's look at this concept graphically. Okay, consider these points here. Now here the origin is not zero, zero. Instead, it is mu x and mu y the mean of x and the mean of y. That's what is at the origin. So the points to the right here, they represent uh, points whose mean is higher than, uh, points which are higher than the mean x. And these points are also on the this quadrant. So all of these points have x value above the mean of x and y value above the mean of y. And here, all of the points have x value less than the mean of x and y values less than the mean of y. Okay, so for all of these points, therefore, uh, xi minus mu x is positive, yi minus mu y is positive. So if, therefore, the product is positive, and therefore, for every single point, this expression, xi minus mu x times yi minus mu y is positive. Similarly here, for uh, every point here, the xi is less than the mean uh, mu x, and yi is less than mu, mu y. Okay, but the product therefore is still positive because this is negative, this is negative, the product is still positive. Okay, so therefore once again, all of these have a positive value for this thing. Therefore, every single point contributes a positive value to this expression and therefore you have a very high covariance. Taking a different example here, here what happens is for these points, xi is greater than mu x, right? That is the x component is bigger than the mean x, but the y component is lower than the mean y, okay? Therefore, one part is positive, the other part is negative, and therefore the overall contribution of each of these points to the covariance is negative. Same thing here too. And therefore, when you have something like this, you have a very high negative covariance, which indicates that when one is high, the other is low, and when one is low, the other is high. Okay, so that's that's the graphical representation. Whereas if you consider something like this, so here the points are all equally distributed in all the four quadrants. So, uh, you know, the positive values and the negative values get offset. So therefore, overall, the covariance is low. Okay, so that's the idea of covariance. Okay, so just like we discussed earlier, looking at the expression for covariance, Right? So if you look at the formula for covariance, x minus mu x has units in which x is measured. Let's say x is height. Right? So x minus mu x might have inches as a dimension, as its uh, you know, dimensions, units. And let's say y is measuring weights. So y minus mu i might have pounds as its unit of measure. Therefore, covariance has a unit of measure which is you know, inches times pounds, something like that, right? Or if, the, if whichever two attributes you are using, it's a product of those the units of those two attributes. Very, very hard to interpret, okay? So that's one problem with, with covariance, that it's a, the units are difficult to interpret. We would ideally like a unitless measure, a dimensionless measure to compare uh, the uh, extent of relationship between multiple attributes, okay? So covariance has units comparisons are problematic, okay? So obviously, we've already discussed that the strength of linear relationship is measured by 
the extent to which the points are close to the line. Okay, the closer they are, the higher is the strength of the linear relationship. So in this case, the points on the right hand side are much more closely, uh, uh, they much more closely relate to the line or they are much closer to the line as compared to these points and therefore these two attributes have exhibit a higher degree of linear relationship. Now what we really want to do is to quantify this in such a way that it is dimensionless. Okay, so here we just have a small question. Which graph shows a better fit? Okay. Now think about it a little bit. Look at the units and everything carefully before you answer. Okay. The point is, of course, the two are exactly the same except that the units on the y-axis are different. Notice that here it goes from uh, 50 to 0 to 350. Here it's going from 0 to, uh, to you know, 800. And therefore, what has happened is all the points have got crunched together and they seem to be close. But actually speaking, they're not. They're all exactly the same thing, right? So if you calculate the, you know, the strength of linear relationship is actually the same for, for both of these cases, okay? So therefore, in order to get a unitless, a dimensionless value for the strength of linear correlation, we use what is called as the correlation coefficient, okay? Now, this formula looks very similar to the one for covariance, assuming x bar is mu of x and y bar is mu of y. Okay, that's the role they're playing. And Sx is, uh, now what we are doing is instead of simply multiplying Xi minus X bar to Yi minus Y bar, we are dividing them by their respective standard deviations. Okay, if you remember, uh, Xi minus X bar, let's say Xi is, these Xs are heights. So Xi minus X bar might have units of inches. Sx, the standard deviation of X also has units of inches. So when you divide all of them, this is a unitless quantity, this is a unitless quantity. Therefore, the overall thing, also becomes a unitless quantity. This is what is called as a correlation coefficient. Okay, so you can compare the strength of correlations of any pairs of variables. That's the beauty of the correlation coefficient. It always has a value of between minus one and plus one. And minus one indicate, plus one indicates perfect correlation. When one increases, the other increases. When one decreases, the other decreases. And all the points fall along a straight line. Minus one also indicates perfect correlation, except that when one increases, the other decreases. Still, the points fall along a straight line. And then you have values in between. Zero indicates complete lack of correlation. The points are all over the map. Okay. Now, these things, you know, if you take the xi minus x bar divided by the standard deviation, this is called as a z-score. It's basically telling you how many standard deviations away from the mean particular value is okay so that's the correlation coefficient it's very great for comparisons okay like I said earlier it has values of between minus 1 and plus 1 